Today, we're getting under the hood of women's health with Dr. Chris Creatura, a unique amalgam menopause expert, NAM certified sex educator, and reproductive freedom advocate. She is the owner of Chris Creatura MDPC Gynecology, Menopause, and Sexual Medicine, and she is a clinical assistant professor of obstetrics and gynecology at Wall Cornell Medical College and the only full-time New York City-based gynecologic fellow in female sexual medicine certified by the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health. Dr. Creatura will get under the hood of libido. So libido is really desire for sex, but it's also a measure of sexual interest. And as a medical practitioner who takes care of people who have sexual complaints, I think of it as a broader concept. Libido really encompasses everything about the culture, everything about the person's medical status. And I try to look at it in a cultural container of all the forces that work to influence one's interest in sex or one's ability to be sexual. So low libido is always going to be contextual. So if I'm trying to evaluate somebody's feelings about their sexual interest, how they feel about those cultural forces is essential, whether it's their religion or whether they're in a relationship where they're having coercion regarding their sexual behavior or whether they're within a family construct where there's no room to be sexual. So when I'm addressing libido, I'm gonna focus primarily on the patient's history, what she actually conveys to me about what's important to her, how she feels that her priorities need to be addressed. And then I'm gonna help her focus on understanding whether she's hormonally replete, making sure that there's not an endocrinopathy or a, an abnormality of her endocrine system that would lead her to have no interest, right? Because your body prioritizes things. And then really address whether she's got cardiovascular issues, diabetes, neurologic problems, to make sure that she's not just hormonally intact, but neurovascularly intact. And then look at the issues that might have related to injuries or trauma or surgery or medical conditions that led her to undergo chemotherapy or some type of operation that might have impaired her. Uh, Part of this evaluation is, of course, getting a really thorough medical history. I can't just talk about libido by itself. It doesn't exist alone. So I think that a lot of women actually don't seek help when they have low desire. I think that it, it is normalized in the culture that women somehow don't deserve to desire pleasure. So it's unusual that women will seek help with their sexual desire. But as a physician, what I'm trying to do is to focus on some of the health history that might lead this patient to seek help from me. And I need to use my expertise as a woman who works in OBGYN, who understands that so many of the events that occur in a woman's life are going to affect her sexual behavior, right? The same material that we're using to get pregnant, give birth, and, and parent children is also the equipment that we're generally using to be sexual. So we've got to understand that these uh, components are going to affect how women feel about their bodies and that injuries and um, experiences that women have in the process of aging and reproduction are going to be relevant. It's fascinating that we all understand that hormones control sexual behavior in all animals, but somehow we have this disconnect about androgens and women. And as a result, we have a lot of misinformation about the way that androgens and estrogens and all hormones might impact sexual behavior. But all of these hormones are involved in sexual behavior in all people, regardless of their gender. And we've got kind of stuck in this way of talking about hormones. As a result, we talk about menopause, and menopause really is simply defined in a very arbitrary way as no menses for a year, not caused by some other reason, really, like no ovulation for a year, therefore no menses, therefore the end of that woman's reproductive capacity, which is sort of amazing because we're so clearly defined by our reproductive capacity, which is really not the purpose of most of the sex that people have. 
So as a result, we don't think about an earlier episode called andropause, which is really when women start to lose their testosterone or their, their major androgens. Testosterone declines at least 10 years before menopause occurs. And many people think that it really starts to decline rapidly in the late 30s, early 40s. And I've observed in years of taking care of women that it's around age 41 that people come into me and say that their diets change, their bodies change, their, the composition of their bodies change, their muscle mass deteriorates, their sleep deteriorates, their interest in sex has waned. It seems to be very correlated with the decline in fertility, which occurs at that same age. Yet nobody's been really emphasizing how important androgens are in that process. I actually think that they're correlated and I think it's understudied. There are so many psychosexual aspects of doing this evaluation that I won't get into with you because I'm gonna focus on what I'm able to do as a physician and what I'm able to teach patients about as a sexual medicine specialist. So there are many interventions that we can make. And there's a lot of uh, misunderstanding about the existence or efficacy of these interventions, but particularly as it concerns menopause or even andropause and then menopause, the hormones I think are the most important interventions. And they're the interventions that I make every day for my patients. So the majority of my postmenopausal women who are complaining about low sexual interest, when I really get to the nitty gritty of what's going on, it's often related to a previously healthy and happy relationship that's become complicated by pain. And it's so hard to get some women to say that they're in pain. So I actually address sexual pain by repleting women's hormones. Because guess what? When your hormones are removed, your genitals aren't getting perfusion. Does this remind you of what happens to men? It's all the same, right? But we focus on genital perfusion for men and we give them PD-5 inhibitors. And when we increase blood flow to their genitals, we're telling them that everything is supposed to be fine. But PD-5 inhibitors don't work in men if they don't have testosterone. So they have to be hormonally replete just like we do. And I try to use this example because I think it normalizes the problems for most people. So I treat pain and I treat pain usually by repletion of hormones, which means treating the genitals locally with estrogens and sometimes androgens if there's pain. I also can use systemic testosterone and systemic estrogen. And when I say systemic, I mean, we're not applying it directly to the genitals. We're applying it to the skin at doses that are, that are going to have impact all over the body, not just the genitals. And I think that it's important to remember that the brain ultimately is going to control everything when it comes to sexual behavior. So we need to get some of those hormones to the brain. You also asked about other pharmacologic options. There are a number of um, medications that have been approved for premenopausal women for low desire. These have only been approved recently. When you say natural remedies, I think of that as different from what many people think of as dietary supplements, right? Because the dietary supplement industry in this country is completely different from our pharmaceutical industry. And when we talk about the word natural, I would say hormones are natural, right? We all produce hormones. And as we age, it's natural that our hormones are being produced less or that our bodies are less efficient at producing them, unfortunately. And I think we have to get away from this idea that it's natural or appropriate for women who now live a third of their life after menopause to just kind of suck it up and dry up and be miserable or endure painful sex just because they should, if they want to hold on to their partner and not complain about getting hot flashes and poor genital perfusion and poor sexual response just because we're not useful in producing children anymore. As much as I will do a lot of psychiatry and sex counseling in my office, this is very time consuming. And it often it often involves really getting under under the hood of the patient's cultural background and religious education and all of the sexual messages that she's embodied her whole life, which is a fun part of what I do. It's it's also part of having a relationship with patients to be able to really discuss that. But um, I also feel like so much of what people do in sex is supposed to be about communication. 
but many of us don't really speak to our sexual partners as much as we should. We don't communicate really well what our desires are and what our problems are. So I think sex therapy and sex coaching is critical. It's a, it's a critical part of helping my patients so that they can actually increase their communication. And I sometimes use a, a paradigm of, you know, if you want to get better in tennis, you got to hire a tennis coach and practice a lot. And that appeals to a lot of people who are uncomfortable with the idea of sex therapy or sex coaching as if like we're all supposed to be so good at it, even though we don't get any good sex education. And if I normalize that for my patient with a sexual complaint, I think it opens up the possibility for her. And if there's a partner, the partner as well, to really explore what's going on with her ideas about her sexuality. And I think for many women, if they've not been in a habit of prioritizing their own pleasure, that sex has always been about prioritizing other people's needs, that sometimes being without a partner can be a total liberation. Sometimes being without a partner can mean that they no longer feel that they have a sexual self. So I really try to get to the root of how that person sees herself sexually. If she says, I have no partner, so therefore I have no sexuality, I want to explore that. Is that... Is that a relief? Is that a stress? Is that something that she wants to change? Because for different people, the answer is different. So for a lot of women, if I'm trying to center how they experience pleasure and how sex is related to that, then we can talk about ways in which I can treat them so that they can have more sexual pleasure. But for some people, the removal of partners from the picture is a type of liberation. You know, I always talk about the tyranny of reproduction, just when women no longer worry about getting pregnant when they have sex, it can change their viewpoint about their sexual behavior and their sexual selves. But I do focus for patients who are interested on self-pleasure and understanding how to give yourself pleasure. I do this with younger women who want to be partnered as well, because I want them to understand that if they can't give themselves pleasure, it's going to be really hard for them to help their partner provide it for them. So I focus on what the patient's needs are and really just ask her, what do, you, what do you think would enhance your life? I can give you the tools. I can put gas in the tank, right? Make the hormones better, take the pain away. But what do you really want to do that gives you pleasure in life? For some people, it could just be going to the ballet. It doesn't have to be sex. So if I have a patient who's talking about lack of interest in sex, I really want to clarify, is this bothering you? Is this distressing you? Or do you feel like it's an obligation? And I also want to normalize for the patient that if she has lost interest in sex and she's being distracted by excessive caregiving responsibilities, too much uh, work stress, not enough sleep, it's normal that she doesn't want to be sexual, right? That those, all of those other stressors are going to take priority. I also try to normalize for a patient who's in a long-term relationship that it's perfectly reasonable that she no longer craves something that she's comfortable with, that she desires. I mean, I should say that she has, right? That if, if you understand that you won't have a spontaneous craving for something that is secure and stable in your life, and that that's normal sexual behavior, it can be very liberating. Because most of my patients who are in good relationships will say that they don't have spontaneous desire for sex, but they can actually have responsive desire that when somebody approaches them, if it's their partner or it's even just some, a sexy experience, if they have the right stimulus, they can be interested. And that once they start feeling sexual and they feel more aroused, they have normal function. I would say the majority of women that I take care of who are in a healthy relationship who say that they have low desire are not even sure if they're distressed. They just feel that their lack of interest is impacting the quality of their relationship and that that creates some distress. And some people feel that kind of the monotony of monogamy leaves them free of any spontaneous desire, but because they still love and respect their partner, if they actually get into a sexual mindset, they have a good response, they get aroused, they have good orgasms and they're happy. But they're worried that they're not normal, right? That they should be craving to have sex with their partner. 
So I try to create a context where they can actually create an environment where sex is going to happen and where they realize that there can be positive reinforcement when they have a positive sexual experience and that cultivating that can be healthy and acknowledging that it's okay that they're not dying to have sex with the same person for 40 years just makes them a normal human.